Hello everyone, in this uh, lecture we're going to be talking about how to compare a flat structure of a cyclohexane at both conformation and chair conformations. And we'll talk about why the chair conformation is more stable than the boat conformation. And even in the chair conformations, obviously you will have two different conformations and uh, one of the conformations you used is more stable. So that we'll talk about in a separate session, but here I'm just going to be focusing on how you actually going to be relating your uh, both conformations and chair conformations and why one is more stable than the other one. So this is the flat structure I have for the cyclohexane and this is how it's going to look like if I draw that right here. And then remember on these um, pictures here, I don't really have any of the hydrogens attached to it just because I didn't want to make it too crowded to so that you it's going to be hard find it's going to be hard to understand it but remember there's six carbons in there so I can kind of count like one two three four five and six and then and that's what you really have on the bottom so that's your flat structured bit and you may see this flat structure written a lot of times but obviously the chair confirmation is going to be the most popular one and uh, you want to kind of get in the habit of drawing these cyclohexane and any of those any of the derivatives of cyclohexanes into the chair conformation. The boat conformation would look something like this. So I still have six carbons, obviously, and it's going to be in the form of a boat. So one of the ways you can draw it, just draw something like this. We got one going up there, then we got one coming down here. So I'm behaving properly. There we go. And then I'll have in the form of a boat here, something like this. And then you'll have it going up again and then coming back down. So I can kind of, uh, if I want to compare this with the picture I have here, I can call this one, two, three, four, five, and six. So this is going to be one, two, three, four, five, and six. And one of the things you want to know about these circles, you don't necessarily have to count from here to be one doesn't really matter you can count any one of those carbons to be one but for the most part you do go clockwise when you're counting it so if you start from somewhere else but just make sure you go clockwise now why it's really called an abode confirmation well you can clearly see how uh, this is actually in the form of a boat so this one and four in the picture you can see right there one and four they are kind of the, the edges of the the boat and then this two and three right there is going to be the front portion of the boat. And a lot of times you may see that drawn in the form of like in a dash or in the form of a solid wedge. That just tells you that it's facing toward you. So that's one thing you want to kind of keep in mind. And then that means these guys are also going to be facing toward you. So you may see something like that. So it's kind of you know, a little bit thicker than the other one. And then the five and six is going to be the back side. So you don't, you're not going to be making those solid wedges. So that's going to be your boat confirmation. I'll talk about why the boat confirmation is less stable than the chair confirmation. Now let's draw the chair confirmation. The chair confirmation actually does look like a chair. So this particular one here, if I want to go ahead and draw it, so I'll still have this top portion looking like this. The left portion I can have is still looking like this. And then I'll have um, a straight bond right there, two bonds right there, and then the other portion or the right side portion is going to be flipped in this case, so it's going to look like this. So that's going to be your chair confirmation where you can kind of think of, okay, this is going to be, you know, coming up and this is going to be coming down. So this this is going to be the back of the chair. The left side is the back of the chair, and this right side is going to be the bottom of the chair or the legs of the chair. So that's what makes it a chair confirmation. And if I want to compare what I really have, let me just kind of erase this, in the picture here. So this is, if I call this maybe one right there, two, three, four, five, and six. So this is going to be one right there that's pointed, that's going to be the leg of the chair, that's two, that's three, that's four, that's five, and that's six. And uh, in this particular case, you can see clearly how one and four, they're kind of opposite to one another, but in case of uh, the boat confirmation, the one and four were actually closer to one another, and that's one of the reasons the boat confirmations are not gonna be as stable. 
you can always draw the flipped form of the chair. So when I draw the flipped form of the chair, let's say if I go ahead and want to flip this, so what really happens, your, uh, the back of the chair becomes the, uh, the legs of the chair and then the legs of the chair is, will become the, the back of the chair. So I can go ahead and draw something like this. Um, this one is going to be a little bit smaller just because I'm running out of space, but it's going to be fairly similar to the other one just in the flip for in the flipped form. So you got one here and then you're going to have two here, three here, four here, five here and six here. So you can clearly see when you flip it, your one goes up there and then your four comes back down. There becomes one becomes the, the back of the chair and your four becomes the legs of the chair. So you want to be able to draw both form of the chair. Okay, now why would one is going to be more stable than the other one? So I'm just going to go ahead and copy this down here and bring that down here. And then in addition to that, I'm going to go ahead and copy this one actually just because I that's the one I have in the picture below. And bring that one down here. So when I'm looking at uh, the positions of the hydrogens that I'm going to be placing here, so there's going to be two hydrogens there. So one of them is going to be pointed this way and the other one is going to be pointed that way. And then the same story on this carbon number one, I'm going to have one hydrogen right there and I'm going to have another hydrogen right there. So in the picture, it doesn't really look that close, but it's usually very close. So just because you got these two hydrogens right there, they're going to be having an asteroid hindrance or another way of saying they're going to be creating a steric hindrance and also called the flag Pole interaction. So make sure you know the terminology there, because that's where your flags usually are when you look at the boat. And if I want to compare that with the structure above there, so that's the boat form, and you can clearly see how um, I got this right there and this right there. They are right next to one another, and that's what they're going to be creating these flag pole interactions. However, when you move on to the chair conformation, and in the chair conformation you can see how one of those is going to be flipped. Uh, and uh, you still have one hydrogen here. I can you know, go ahead and draw the hydrogen right there. And then the other hydrogen is going to be right there. But when I'm looking at four, you're going to be in a similar scenario where you're going to have two hydrogens, but none of those hydrogens are really interacting with one another anymore. So there is no flagpole interactions and that's the reason why your chair conformation is going to be always more stable than your boat conformation and even in chair conformations you would have some conformations to be more stable than the other and I'll talk about that in a separate video but here I just want to be comparing the boat and the chair and then now I'm going to talk about the different positions in the chair conformation now from here on we're just going to be focusing on the chair and uh, let's talk about uh, the different positions you can have in the chair conformations. So the two positions you really have to worry about, one of them is called an axial and the other one is called an equatorial. I'll go ahead and draw the axial position first and then I'll draw the equatorial. So when you're drawing the axials, and I'm going to go ahead and start it from right here, that's carbon number one, two, three, four, five, and six your axials are actually going to be going up and down on alternate positions. So remember, this carbon number one, suppose this is going down right there, so that's going to be your axial position. And you can relate this particular one right there with this position I have right there in the actual picture. So I'm just going to cross that right there. So that you can't really draw a three-dimensional structure when you're looking at uh, the, page, uh, the pages, but you have to kind of imagine this being in a three-dimensional structure in your mind when you're doing these problems. So this is going to be going down, and on the second carbon it's going to be going up like this, and on the third carbon it's going to be going down, fourth carbon is going up, the fifth carbon is going down, and the sixth carbon is going to be going up. So I can, if I want to count those in terms of where you can see them actually uh, properly, I can call this A right there, a B right there, a C right there, and then you have a D back here 
and then you got E and then you got an F there so I can call this A uh, call this B right there C D this is E and that's gonna be your F so all those positions are gonna be your active positions and you can clearly see how they go up and down on alternate positions if I wanna count the number of carbons on this uh, picture right there I'm gonna be calling this one here two here three here four and your five is kind of back there you really can't see it properly there in this picture and then your six is gonna be right there so remember your two three are gonna be facing toward you so you may want to draw this two and three a little bit of a uh, solid wedges here something like that and then this one and the two bond is kind of coming toward you so you may see in the pictures drawn something like that and the same can be said about the bond between four and three so it's going to be like that so whatever is the shaded part that's going to be facing toward you and whatever is the non-shaded part is going to be actually back in the page so that's how you want to be looking into those now once you actually go ahead and draw these uh, um, axial positions rather the next thing is you want to be able to look at your equatorial position so maybe I can just go ahead and copy this down here and I'll erase some part of it so that it's not uh, too crowded okay so that should be good so I got all the axial positions already in there now it's time to draw your equatorial positions now one of the best way to draw the equatorial position you look at how your one bond away how the bond is going to be oriented not the next bond so if i'm focusing on spouse drawing the equatorial position on this carbon one here i want to be focusing on the bond that's between carbon two and three right there or i can focus on the bond that's going to be between five and six so how do you know which bond you're going to be focusing on you're not going to be focusing on the next bond but it's going to, you're going to be focusing on the bond that's going to be one sigma bond away. So in this case, one sigma bond away from this carbon number one is going to be the bond between the second and third carbon or the bond between the carbon five and carbon six. So those are going to be parallel and your equatorial position on this carbon one is actually also going to be parallel to those particular bonds. So it's going to be pointed like this. So that's going to be your equatorial position. So that's what we really have down there if I want to compare it with um, what I have just drawn right here. So that's how you're going to be looking at it. And then let's say if I want to kind of go ahead and, and you know, put all of those into the perspective there and draw all the your equatorial positions. So I'll just draw them right here. It kind of becomes crowded and you can clearly see how you know all those equatorial positions kind of represented by these uh, uh, white balls there. And that's what we're really going to have down here. Now, how do you draw the equatorial position on this carbon number six, I suppose? So when I'm looking at carbon number six, let me change the color there. So carbon number six, I'm going to be focusing on which particular bond? Well, the bond I'm going to be focusing on is going to be either this bond right there. Remember, you don't focus on the bond that's going to be connected to that particular carbon, but it's going to be the bond that's going to be one sigma bond away, where I'm going to be focusing on the bond that's going to be between four and five. So when I'm drawing something parallel to those, that's how it's going to look like. So this is going to be your another equatorial position at that particular carbon. And you can just do something like that all through uh, the chair there if I'm looking at carbon number three suppose so carbon number three oh, no, I think uh, I have to use the same color there and carbon number three I'm gonna be which particular bond I'm gonna be focusing on well technically I'm gonna be focusing on the bond between carbon one and two again or the bond between carbon four and five because those are gonna be one Sigma bond away from that particular position so that's going to be looking something like this. So that's going to be another equatorial position. What about carbon number four? On carbon number four, I'm going to be focusing on which particular bond? That's right. It's going to be carbon, the bond between five and six, or the bond between two and three. So it's going to be looking something like this. So that's going to be another equatorial. 
um, the confusion always comes along whenever you're looking at uh, the carbons that are actually going to be in the ring or like in the middle of the rings. So we're looking at carbon 5 and carbon 2, so how they are going to be oriented. So let's just uh, maybe change the color there. So the font I'm going to be focusing on when I'm looking at to make an equatorial position on carbon number 5 is going to be either the bond between 4 and 3 right there or I'm going to be looking at the bond that's going to be between uh, 6 and 1 because those are the bonds that's going to be one sigma bond away from the carbon number 5. So when I'm drawing the equatorial, you want to draw a parallel line to those either 4 and 3 bond or, or the 1 and 6 bond. So it's going to be looking something like this. So it's going to be another equatorial position there. And when I'm looking at 2, we're kind of looking at a very similar scenario. Now you don't want to be uh, making that going up on 2 because you already have the axial right there that's going up. So in that case it's going to be going down, but it's going to be going down parallel to the bond 1, 6 or the 3, 4. So it's going to be looking something like this. So that's going to be your, another equatorial position. So this is how you're going to be drawing your axials and your equatorials. And always keep in mind one at one particular carbon, so if I focus on maybe uh, carbon number six, if your axial is pointed up in this case, you're going to be calling that going up and your equatorial is going to be going down. That's how you want to look at it. When I'm looking at maybe carbon number one here, in carbon number one, your axial is pointed down. So it's going to be down here and your equatorial is going to be pointed up here. So you want to kind of see how those things going to be oriented in the space to make those or to kind of orient or define those as up or down. And then um, the other thing I want to kind of uh, mention here, whenever you flip the ring, so suppose I got uh, this particular ring right there. Um, I'm going to go and draw that out. So you can see there's one here, two here, three here, and then your four here. Your five is kind of back there and then there's six there. So it's one, two, three, four, five, and six. And I have all the axial positions in there. I didn't really draw any of the equatorial positions because I want to show you what happens in terms of uh, uh, flipping the ring. So I'm going to go ahead and copy this as well just uh, because I want to do another example here. So when I draw all my axials, it's going to be going down here. That's going to be going up. That's going to be going down here. That's going to be going up. Five is down. And then six is going to be up. So that's exactly how it actually looks like on this picture. We got uh, these um, equatorial, uh, these axial positions here going up and down. Now, what happens when you flip the ring? So when you flip the ring, like in this case, I'm going to flip it. Um, your axials becomes equatorial, and your equatorial is going to become axial whenever you flip the ring. So when I'm flipping this particular ring, I'm going to be redrawing those where the carbon 4 now is going to be going down and your carbon 1 is going to be going up. So uh, draw it something like this. Okay, so then this becomes 1 right there because you just flipped it. Then you have 2 here, 3 here, 4 here, 5 here, and 6 here. And then what I'm going to be looking at, whatever the positions you had earlier, they were all axial positions in this particular case, they all going to become equatorial now. So that's one important thing you always want to keep in mind. Anytime you flip the ring, every position gets flipped. Your axials becomes equatorial and your equatorial is going to become axials. So this is how it's going to look like. And I'll number those in that picture that I have up, up there. Okay, so I can call this uh, one right there. That's going to be your two right there. So you can clearly see how this right there is kind of uh, related to that. And then this four right there is going to be in the picture right there. So three, four, and then the four, you can see this is going equatorial now. And that's what's how it's going to be looking at. So everything gets flipped when you're making the, uh, when you're flipping the ring. Your axial becomes equatorial and your equatorial becomes axial. So if I want to actually take an example, so suppose I got an, uh, 
a methyl there, so I got in the CH3 there, and I got in the hydrogen there as an example. So when I go ahead and split this, and then go ahead and draw this going down now. Okay, so I got uh, one here now, two, three, four, five, and six. So your methyl previously was in the equatorial position right there, and your hydrogen was in the axial position. So when you flip it, your methyl is going to become the axial now, and your hydrogen is going to become the equatorial. That's the whole idea behind flipping the ring. And then obviously one is going to be more stable than the other one, and that's the, usually the question like, would you figure out which one is going to be more stable? And um, the bottom idea is uh, if you, the biggest group you have, you want to put that on the equatorial. Or another way of saying the more groups you have on the equatorials, the better you are in terms of the stability. And I have a se separate session where I'll do multiple examples of uh, two different shear conformations and trying to figure out which one is more stable. But in this particular case, I have the first one where uh, the CH3 is in the equatorial, so as a result, this one is going to be more stable. All right, so hopefully this was helpful uh, in terms of determining uh, why chair is more stable than the boat and be able to draw all those equatorials and axial positions. If you have any questions, uh, any concerns on any of those topics, feel free to leave any comments in the section below.